my father knew Ray Brooks, and the story is that Ray Brooks was in the old guard with him, and he knew he flew in World War One, and he knew he was a famous ace, and he knew the story about the Smithsonian, which do you guys all know? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Ray Brooks goes to the hangar, sees this tattered spad, he climbs in, and the technician says, you can't do that. And Ray Brooks says, but that's my plane. And the technician says, wait right here. So they, you know, they, they, they do this, they do interviews with Ray, they realize it's his plane, they restore the plane, and then um, my father finally goes to the Smithsonian, and there's a video of Ray Brooks in a wheelchair. Has anybody seen the video there? And he's, you know, he's the nicest guy in the world, and he's, he's talking about this, and he says, there was only one guy lost in that fight, and it was Phil Hassinger of New York, and that's my father's uncle. Right. And, and Ray Brooks had died at that point, and my father didn't know that he flew with my uncle because the, the things didn't come down in my family very well. So my father and I um, went to the Smithsonian Archives in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is just like this shed. Has anybody been there? And um, we went through the Ray Brooks Archive, and also the thing was my uncle went to Columbia. So Columbia University had a very active um, man in Paris, and they had a very active archive system, and there was a lot of um, information there. So what I'm going to try and do with this speech is not show you the um, uh, History Channel thing with all the airplanes whizzing. I'm going to use the archives and Ray Brooks language and letters from my family about the actual first first-hand account of the war. So we're going to start with Arthur Ray Brooks, the ace. And this is his spad, and this picture is from Howard. This is my uncle, Lieutenant Phil Hassinger. And uh, this is a framed photo that everyone in my family had. And I don't know what point they took it, but we all had it. And he started out on September 14th with Ray Brooks on a 2.15 in the afternoon patrol and they flew in a V formation. What year? 1918, September 14. Protecting a photographic mission, one man came back and the other one didn't. So let's set the scene. Um, here's the, the, this is the plane. Uh, and this is what Ray Brooks had to say about the SPAD. He flew several and the one pictured is now restored at the Air and Space Museum. He said, and this is from a letter to his wife that he wrote when he was pretty well nerve knocked and they, they <laughs> threw him off, off camp and made him rest. Um, I marvel at the flim flimsiness and the construction and the strain that that same flimsiness withstands. The SPAD is an almost perfect airplane in design. In weight, its weight is such that it requires an enormous pulling power to keep it in the line of flight. The motor we have seems capable of the job surely enough, for my level air speed at 10,000 feet is in the neighborhood of 198 kilometers an hour, or 123 miles per hour. On a stiff climb, it makes 75 miles an hour and goes into the thin, cold atmosphere above 14,000 feet in a little over 20 minutes time. Think of the time it takes an explorer to gain the same height by scaling, say, Pike's Peak. The SPAD, he goes on, is also made of a heavier motor and more gun in both single and double seater planes. The weight is necessary because the Germans' favorite tactic <coughs> is a swooping dive a burst of machine gun fire and a prolonged dive to the safety of the Hun lines. If the Bosch is successful in his shots, well and good. If he is not, then he has nothing to lose. The first Allied machines were too light, but the SPAD is built to withstand the tremendous diving speed and strain, and subsequently the Hun, look, Hun looks for other odds in his favor than mere diving ability. So what was it like on September 14th? got to think about the weather if you're flying. The battle to wipe out the San Miguel Salant began between 12 o'clock, this is Ray Brooks' words, 
and 1 o'clock on the morning of September 12th. We had been tensely waiting for the storm to break. When it did, we were left with a strong west wind and rain and, cl and low clouds. In spite of the weather, we had to fly. It was terrible. Formations flew below the clouds over the struggle and had hard work keeping together. More than one machine was hit by bullets from the ground. Crashes were seen all over the country. Most of my, my patrols were used up by dodging from one thunderstorm to another. At periods of clarity, we could see the villages and all the litter of war. A weird exhibition and we were all in the gallery seats. So this is from my uncle. Uh, Brooks' description of the war is frank because he's writing to his wife at, after near, nearly losing his wife, life. But the general tenor of discourse about the war was upbeat and almost college-like as if the war were a football game. A dandy crowd, my uncle writes, one bullet hole and a request for boots. This is a letter to his fellow alum, Horatio Kranz of Columbia University at the Service Bureau in Paris. So why were they flying? Dogfights were a byproduct of the 22nd Airborne's mission. They were not the purpose. As Brooks says, we protected the biplane observation buses. We cleared the sky of Germans for a depth of nearly six miles in advance of the front line. We chased Huns and we fought Huns. It was a hot time all around. So September 14th dawns and there's the morning patrol. The morning patrol was routine. Brooks says, at 10.30, I led a patrol protecting photographic salmons who were taking pictures in and out of the Hun lines. We chased off the mar a marauder above, one to the side, and stayed up until the gas ran out. Then dinner, and up into the air again at 2.15, the whole squadron. So this is the afternoon patrol. We narrowed down to six, the others dropping out with trouble, one trouble or another. At 3.15, we were to meet one lone um, photographic plane. Our formation cut across Lake La Chasse and headed for Mar Le Tour. We were up nearly 5,000 meters, which in feet is 16,400. The whole map showed so clearly with the lake below the lake is on the right. Do you see that, like, blue stuff? Um, it's 16,000 feet with no oxygen? No oxygen, and it's cold. There's a push button on the remote. There's a push button on the remote for the laser. That's you can't survive. Okay, so just pay attention to the lake, because it's going to come up later. Um, so the lake, he sees the lake and shell-torn shell Verdun to our west. Fires were going below, stores the Huns were burning in their retreat. At three o'clock, we observed three formations of Bosch, about 10 kilometers still further inland. The first one was of six Bosch, the second had five, and the last was a knockout of 12 or 14 planes. All were of the latest type of Fokker D7, beauties. Being on the captain's left, I cut directly off across his tail and opened up, up on the wolves that came down on us from our right quarter. At that, everything was white streams of incendiary bullets, much the same in effect as the confetti at Harvard class day. So intertwined they were. Here is where God's secret happened. I don't know how I got out of it alive. This is a Fokker, but this, there's no pictures, obviously, of what Ray Brooks did. I did things with my plane that I had never been taught to do and never thought could be done. Eight of the beggars went down on me from 5,000 meters to 1,000 meters. My control seemed wobbly, yet I kept my everlasting twisting, for I couldn't afford to stop for a moment in the mad twirl. He was so surrounded that if he didn't go like this all the time, they could shoot him. and and. One of their pro the problems really was that they were they were so many of them they were afraid of shooting each other, so that that helped him also. 
but he had to dive and twirl and not do anything static. Oops. I think I have this at the right one. Okay. I would look to my left and there was a red nose surging on me. I would jam the stick over and point to him, letting him have a few bursts just to let him know that I still had some ammunition left. My right gun stopped. A bullet talked dir directly across my eyes and caused me to feel of my glasses. But it's, it was the one that cut through the tra tank just above my head. The worst part of it was seeing the red devils circling in my direction, two or three together, while the others sought fresh positions. I figured that the Bosch were in their own way. One came down on my tail. I swam about and ran at him, firing a short burst as I went. I tried to crash us both. I mean, this is like hand-to-hand -hand combat. They're, 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 he's trying to ram him because he basically thinks he can't get out of it. But he zoomed over my head, and I went into a dive and came out headed again towards our line. Another fellow came at me from the right quarter. As I turned to meet him, I veered left, and he turned about as he swooped down in front of me, not 50 feet ahead. I shall never forget his upturned face, that fine-looking German, as I pulled into a stall and went down straight on him, almost hitting him as he swept back under me. I shot him. So this was 10 minutes of his life, this, this air fight. And then I guess an American Archie came out and it drove off half the tormentors so that from then on, I had less difficulty in gaining our lines just below the lake. I was then but a couple thousand feet above the rolling hilling country where I could see troops digging in, artillery moving up, supply trains and trucks crawling about. I came drunkenly in at the level of our balloons and sought for a field to land. I got into a rough place somehow, got out of my plane, and cried like a baby for <coughs> the first time since the days when my dad used to teach me manners. I thought everybody but myself had been killed. A doughboy came up, as did Lieutenant Crowell, who had a biplane in the emergency field, which it was, and I finally got back to Earth via cigarette and a nip and got a telephone message to our field to come after me with a mechanic and new controls and I'd fly back. He just thought he could get a new plane and fix it and fly right back. But they wouldn't let me do that, so they telephoned and I rested an hour and finally got transportation to the, to the camp, where I found out that the captain and all the others except Phil Hassinger <coughs> were back. Kimber's machine was full of all holes and the others were all right. They told me I got one of the Bosch down in flames and cut another to pieces. I, of course, couldn't tell very well because the whole gang was on me. It was too pressing for me to watch one of them for very long, and I couldn't help hitting them because all my shots were nearly point blank. Um, this is an archival shot, not of him landing in this day, but it's a similar time when he was forced down. I finally had a chance to go over my machine. It was more or less riddled. The tank just above my head had been cut through. One bullet burned itself out in the main spar of my upper left plane. 122 in all went through the plane. All except three were within, were within two feet of my body, and five were within six inches of my head or my back. Wow. One severed my rudder control. Several bracing wires were hit and broken. My longer arm was cut through just behind my left shoulder. I remember bracing my left leg for the shot I expected coming from a fellow who came in from that side. One of his billets, bullets cut the fuse spring in my right gun. That was why it stopped. It, in the impossible position I got into, he's referring to the, the need to keep diving and diving and diving. The gasoline couldn't always feed. One had to momentarily level off to get the proper carburation. It would, and it was with grim fascination watching my prop almost come to a dead stop, then catch with a bang that thwacked the whole plane. The engine is supposed to turn over 2,000 revolutions in a minute, and I had never run it above that. 
but my roving, raving playing took in the fact that I was turning 2,350 revolutions. I didn't care whether it burst or not, but it got me back. Hmm. So this is when he's off, they've, they've shut, shut him off and said, you have to rest. And he writes to his wife, dear precious. I wanted to go right up again I, before I'd lose my nerve, but the colonel and the captain packed me and Schwab out of camp for a few days rest away from the bombs and the sound of airplanes and guns. So I, here I am in this garden paradise for yet another day. I'm going to do nothing but swap stories with the wounded about the place and get sleep. By the way, this place now, the Hotel du Parc, is a club med. <laughs> he goes on to tell his wife that the day after his dog fight, Lieutenant Gross returned from an early morning session with the glad news that I got two of them out of eight or nine. So I suppose that makes me an ace if, the, if five is the number. One on July 29, one on September 2, one on September 4, and two on September 14, official. The two with Putnam were not official. So this is a notice of him getting an ace, and uh, it's a quote. It says, First Lieutenant P.E. Hassinger and Second Lieutenant A.H. Brooks, 22nd Aero Squadron, 2nd Pursuit Group, are hereby credited with the destruction in combat of two enemy Fokkers in the region of Marla Tour at 4,700 meters altitude on September 14, 1918, at 1520 o'clock. Hmm. But if you, if you look at it, it says over up at the top. If you turn it over, which we did at the Smithsonian, um, on the back, Ray Brooks has written, Phil H. disappeared at the beginning of the scrap. We hope he landed in Germany, but of course we can't tell. Therefore, it's sort of an unwritten law that any man who disappears in a scrap where the Huns are downed should have part credit. So it's hard to tell whether who shot these down, but it, the, the code of honor is that both men get the credit. So what happened to Phil Hassinger? <coughs> like Lieutenant Brooks, Phil Hassinger was the best and the brightest. Class of 1914 from Columbia, thespian, varsity hockey player, fraternity brother. He was restless in business, enlisted in the National Guard. He was chosen for officer's training and then, because of his quote, excellent physical condition, the ground school for aviators at MIT, Ray Brooks' alma mater. When he was lost, my grandfather, my great grandfather was beside himself. Jacob P. Hassinger was a Madison Avenue dentist and he was bereft when he received the cable that his oldest son was missing. Columbia University wanted to include Phil in a war memorial issue, but Dr. Hassinger, who's, this is his letter, refused in numerous times. In the letter shown here, he explained that Phil shared credit with Ray Brooks for the two downed enemy aircraft, and I quote, Phil's last letter home, dated September 12th, two days before he disappeared, complained that he was having a great deal of trouble with his engine. I feel sure that what happened to him was that he made a landing. As they were fighting 15 miles inside the German lines, he couldn't make the American lines. Whether he made the landing safely or was hurt, of course we do not know. At least we do not believe that his machine went up in flames, as somebody would have seen that. So he keeps refusing to put his son in, in the Columbia War, War Memorial. And they have a <coughs> memorial service, and he, the Columbia notes do not mention his son's name. Hmm. After the armistice, Phil's best friend, who was also in, uh, deployed in France near the 22nd Airborne, scoured France with a, a motorcycle looking for clues to his friend's body. Letters were sent to Ray Brooks. The, Brooks was always the focal point in any time something came up about Phil Hassinger. And the doctor still refused to is, accept the fact that his son was dead. Writing to him was not a pleasant task. 
and Lieutenant Doolin, who flew with the 22nd Airborne, del delayed until January 1, 1919, and he, when he attempted to set the matter to rest. Doolin wrote Dr. Hassinger the following. Led by our flight commander, Lieutenant Brooks, we, are on, we were on patrol at 18,000 feet, which is a different altitude than other people say in the region of Metz, approximately 10 miles behind enemy lines, when we were attacked by eight enemy Fokkers. Phil was flying first man on the left of the le leader. We were in a V formation. Phil was next. He was either hit by explosive bullets, which may have exploded his gas tank, or a direct hit from a ground anti-aircraft gun. So his machine was absolutely demolished in the air. There is no doubt that he was killed instantly. His place could never be taken in a squadron as the loss of a boy of his caliber was impossible to replace. <clears throat> it is hard for me to tell you this, but I know you will be glad to know the facts. Phil was an exceptional flyer, very cool, and level-headed. Dr. Hassinger finally came to, to the conclusion that he had to have an obit published and it was time to label Phil as gone but not forgotten. The family was still reeling from grief and the writing of the obituary fell to the college friend who had scoured France on the, on the motorcycle. Phil Hassinger was honored with a memorial in France and a monument at the family cemetery in Valhalla. But did he really get shot down in flames? Phil was officially missing, and he still is to this day, um, records were inaccurate, and Dr. Hassinger received news that Phil's grave had been found. Dr. Hassinger felt the site wasn't in the right location, and through Columbia con Connections succeeded in having the grave dug up. He was a dentist. He had all of Phil's dental records. The grave belonged to another man. Mm. Oh, well. Germany had records of its own, detailing who their pilots had shot down and what date. The ace who claimed credit for Phil's plane was contacted. He wrote that the spad that Phil flew went into a thousand pieces. I quote, this was rarely seen and I cannot explain myself the reason. Anyhow, the result was like an explosion. The flight took place over the big lake of La Chasse, so the body might have disappeared therein. So he could have fallen in the lake. Mm. That's why they can't find him. Mm. The, f the family relaxed into normalcy. Then, in 1934, Dr. Hassinger received a letter from Germany informing him that Phil's belt had been found. Hmm. Carl Specht wrote to say, quote, I am in possession of the belt which your son carried on his last flight in 1918, wrapped around his knapsack or roll or overcoat. The plane flown by your son was hit by an anti-aircraft gun, which is a different reason hmm. than all the other reasons, lost one wing and crashed. Hmm. The attempt made by your son to save himself by jumping without a parachute did not succeed. Again, another reason. Hmm. In this manner, your son died in the field of honor in the neighborhood of Chamblay, about 30 kilo kilometers west of Metz. I believe in fulfilling my duty to the dead by forwarding to you the belt mentioned earlier in this letter as soon as I have your reply. I'm not up to speed. Let's see. This is my dad. Um, my dad, who spoke to this group, and it's the reason entirely why I'm here. Um, my dad was lucky enough to know Ray Brooks, though not through his connection to Phil Hasinger. We lived in Berkeley Heights, not far from Bell Labs, where Ray Brooks worked. My father was in the Summit Old Guard with Brooks and knew the story of how he went to the Smithsonian and saw the tattered spad in the restoration facility in Silver Spring, <coughs> Maryland, and, and climbed in. The technician chewed him out, but it is my plane, Ray exclaimed with tears in his eyes. Stay right there, the technician said. After Ray Brooks died, my, finally, my father finally got the chance to visit the famous spad at the Smithsonian. If you've been there, you'll remember our video interview with Brooks in a wheelchair. It's a short video, Brooks talks about the SPAD being a flying machine gun, and it ends with Brooks saying that 
No one was lost in that flight over Marla Tour but Phil Hassinger of New York. Phil Hassinger's memory has come down through my father's family with grief and but few details. It was then my father's turn to have tears in his eyes. What type of plane did your father fly? Uh, so this is the end, actually. Uh, I think it was a B-25 bomber. Is that right? Could South be. Pacific? South Pacific. Yeah. He was, he was <laughs> Yeah, he was a bomb. He's a navigator bombardier. He went to school twice, and if you were a navigator bombardier, you went to the South Pacific. Yeah, that's the plane that they flew for the uh, carrier, the bomb, the 16 planes. The Doolittle. The Doolittle. The Doolittle. The Doolittle. The Doolittle. So, is that? That's it. I'm done. Question, please. If you have any better questions, I want to just make a statement. We've had great presentations by a lot of people here. But this one is so touching. I mean, yeah. it is so real. Yeah. I mean, I felt felt like I was with them in World War One. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's and now pleasure. that I've had my piece, anybody wants to ask questions? Is that please. the symbol for the uh, chapter, the shooting star? Yes. Uh, Howard can tell you. Yes, that is. Yeah, that's uh, that's the um, shooting star is. Uh, the symbol of a 22nd pursuit uh, group or, or squadron, of which um, Brooks was the the uh, leader, Captain Captain Brooks. If all of that happened today, there would be no written record because everybody used a damn cell phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it might. Well, I don't know. If you look at the um, History Channel thing. Um, it, it, they just skip saying Ray Brooks' diary, Ray Brooks' diary, diary. My father's point was he looked at Ray Brooks' diary and it says, see a letter to Ruthie, see a letter to mother. He didn't have the oomph to write one more thing in his diary. So it, it's, it's in those letters that he tells everything. Hmm. And, and he tells it and he, he advises his wife, don't tell anyone I'm a hero. Just don't. Because it, it wasn't, it was... It, this, you don't do this for glory. You do this because you have to. He's a survivor. Yeah. So um, the um, the first dogfighters um, video that was produced by uh, well for the History Channel, right? And I guess maybe it was done also by the Smithsonian. Is embellished a bit. Would you say? I think it's it's theatrical and. Um, at the end, uh, somebody who's better at uh, air warfare than I am, at the end it says that, that Brooks took down four planes, and I'm not sure how that happened, because he doesn't say anything beyond receiving two credits. Right, okay. Yeah, it does say that he shot down four. That's correct, yes. But, but it's apparently not true. <laughs> Based there, on could be, there could be some other documentation I don't know about, so I, I don't want to say that. Mm -hmm. per se. Um, but it's also the records are really spotty. My father did some research into um, like who who was supposedly shot down that day and they don't appear to have died. So it, 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 I think there's just a lot of misinformation about that that time period. Okay. Any other questions? Give us a chance to think of some more questions. <laughs> <laughs> this, was, this was too good to not ask more questions. Are you publishing books on the subject? Well, here's how it worked. My father taught U.S. history in Scotch Plains okay. for a lot of years, and then he retired, and I was a magazine writer, and I said, Dad, you've got to write books. Here's, uh, my dad was, everyone in my family was a storyteller, and history was the way he told stories because, uh, he, he had a kind of tough life, and he would tell you about what a president did instead of what he did. And so uh, I had a friend who worked in publishing, and I got an agent, and we sold a proposal in a week and a half. And so we wrote um, anecdotal, you know, stories about American history. So, and then um, when for the bicentennial of the White House, we did a book on what it was like to live in for 40 families in one house for 200 years. And that brought in my background in, in, I worked in design, so I interviewed curators and I knew a lot about 
the restoration and that kind of thing. So that was interesting. But I'm not really a historian, I'm a writer. And I just adored my father, that's mm -hmm. the way it goes. By the way, she brought some of the books. The Great American Anecdotes. Um, is this can you one? read it on the, so we can all hear it? Yeah, this, yeah. this is the second one called Great American Anecdotes, which it, these are all just fun little tidbits. And this is this is the first one that got us started uh, on the format. And uh, What's the title? this is called Oh Say Can You See Unexpected Anecdotes About American History. And then this is the one that uh, about the White House and um, on. Uh, November 1st was the anniversary of the date that John Adams moved into the White House. Um, you know, and he came, he had to travel down from Massachusetts, and they didn't know exactly when he was arriving. And the plaster was drying, and they were running the fires, and they, the servants didn't know exactly what to do. Um, and Abigail Adams got lost in the woods on the way because Washington was so new. And, but on November 1st, on the bicentennial of the White House, my father was interviewed by Dan Rather on CBS Evening News, and I think that was the highlight of his life. <laughs> now those books are for sale, correct? So... What Jim? Pages of these pilots, your great uncle, the Ray Brooks, when they were flying. I guess they had to be young and didn't know any better. <laughs> well... Yeah, I think I think Michael was about 24. I'm not sure. Ray Brooks was probably older than that. I'm looking at Howard. Um, well, he graduated. Yeah, he graduated from MIT, and then he went directly into the um, service. I guess first with the Canadians, and then with the American uh, training, and then uh, I, I think he. I'm not sure if he graduated in 1917. Uh, I think he did, and then he was uh, shipped to uh, France in uh, like March of 1918. So, you know, he's got to be in the early 20s. Well, at this time, I don't think they took anyone into into the air <coughs> air corps. It was it was really it was a hard thing to run those machines, and it, I mean, as you could tell, Ray Brooks did his. His gun was out. I mean, he had to, there's something about torquing the way he had to torque his plane because this wasn't working and that wasn't working. And I didn't quite understand it, but um, he knew that plane so well. Yes, that you, had, you had to have a lot of skill and a lot of knowledge. Um, yeah, they had a lot of mechanical problems during World War One, and uh, Eddie Rickenbacker was uh, he was the commander of the uh, 94th Squadron. And uh, ba based on his racing skills, he was one of the older uh, uh, World War I aviators. Um, because based on his uh, racing skills and, and experience, um, he had a, um, uh, a program within his squadron to um, baby the engines or, you know, keep them. I, th I think he, he told all of his pilots, you know, don't run your planes full out unless you have to, you know, in a, in a fight. And so they babied their engines uh, because of the, you know, the problems they had with the engines. Also with the guns, um, they had jams with, with quite frequently, so, you know, you, you couldn't fight off a, uh, an attacker. But then they, they had people, well, within the, the squadron itself, uh, they had uh, like mechanics or people that were working on the guns and, and the ammunition and so forth that would set up uh, like a, um, uh, a gauge and it would put, put, put the ammunition through, through this gauge and if some were, were over, oversized, you know, it would cause a jam. And, and so they eliminated those. So Eddie Rickenbacker and his squadron were very successful because of uh, the way they treated their their engines and their ammunition. <laughs> what's our next meeting and who's, what's the topic? Well, our next meeting, well, hopefully uh, you'll all come out to uh, November 2nd at the uh, Morris County Library. Uh, for the November 10th. November 10th. 10th. November 10th. Yeah. Saturday, November 10th, yes. Where's that going to be? It's going to be at the Morris County Library. It'll be around uh, 1045. <laughs> Hope you can make it. Well, we'll we will 
be presenting the um, Eddie Rickenbacker um, in his Spod 13 print done by Keith Ferris. Keith Ferris will be there. Uh, he may talk about, uh, you know, uh, how he came about to, um, to do that print, that painting, and also talk about me. He's, he's writing a book um, about um, Air Force aviation and early, uh, I guess, U.S. Army service aviation as well. And maybe Claire, will you want to come over and maybe you want to give a little, little blurb on uh, your great, great uncle? Let's talk afterwards. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, Claire, your, your great uncle was, he was an American, as was Ray Brooks. Were, were they part of an all-American group, or were they integrated into a, a British group? Like the 22nd, was that all-American, or? I, I think it was, but actually the thing is, my, my uncle was from Germans, I mean, and when he went off, his mother said, don't shoot any Germans. <laughs> <laughs> but I also think that was one reason why he went, because he was, he was, a, he was very proud to be an American. <laughs> yes. Um, 80, 80, 80. Okay, thank you. Thank you.